Okay, we're going to get started. Well, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Andrea Sampson, the host and moderator of our Sense Making Conversations and the CEO of Talk Boutique. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm sitting here in my home office and my daughter and I have been in very close proximity for the past six months or so, sorry, six, for the past month or so. Six months would be a little long. Um, and our communications have become actually pretty easy. I can ask her something and well, usually she answers. But that isn't always the case with my team who are now working from their homes as well. And our communications are all now digital from Slack to text to email to video conferencing. We're relying on digital communications for almost every interaction. And while this has made for some interesting situations, I'm sure many of you are feeling this as well as you adjust to our new normal and find ways to communicate in the midst of so much change. Now who here has had a digital communication misunderstanding? If you have, type yes in the bar below. Yeah, I know many of you have. I mean, this is so common today. Digital miscommunications can create stress, difficult and unnecessary conversations. And ultimately, they can make for really, really bad days. Our guest today, Dr. Mary Donahue, has been researching this phenomena for the past few years. And she has empirical data that shows that email is clearly understood just 20% of the time, 20%. Yeah. That means 80% of the time, the message you meant to give was not understood in the way you intended. I don't know about you, but that sure explains a lot for me and some of those misunderstandings. Dr. Mary's research also shows that by classifying those you communicate with into groups, you can identify patterns and therefore get it get better at making sure your communications are clear. This is fascinating research, and I can only imagine how powerful this could be used, this could be when used across all of our communications. Dr. Mary is a social scientist with a focus on digital psychology, and most recently, she's been studying why we speak and act the way we do, and how we can shift to be even more effective. She's been named as one of the 18 outstanding women in tech and diversity. Dr. Mary is passionate, is a passionate advocate of revolutionizing today's workforce training through technology and developing internal talent. Dr. Mary's new book on digital communications, Message Received, will be available in the fall of 2020 and is likely to become the definitive post-COVID tool for digital communications. All right, before I hand it over to Dr. Mary, I wanna remind you all of the question and answer bar below. Make sure that you type your questions in there as Dr. Mary is speaking, and we'll be taking questions a bit later. Now, now Dr. Mary, tell us, how can we all get better at communicating with our remote teams? I think, um... Thank you, and thank you for having me. Hi, happy Friday, everybody. I'm glad you're all working from home today, um, as I am, as you can see. <laughs> but uh, one of the things, if we want to get better, is we have to look at where we're starting from. And that's always the most important. I think all of us were thrown into quarantine. If you would have asked me at Christmas, hey, what do you think is going to happen this year? The last thing I would have said is I'm going to be locked up in my house with my mother, my husband, and my daughter for six weeks. Um, and so it's always good to go back to the start and look at how this virus, you know, caused us to change. Something else really caused us to change, Andrea, and that was way back in 2007 when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone. He changed how we're going to communicate forever. And I think one of the things that we have to be really aware of is even though our communication patterns changed, our brain hadn't changed how we're processing communication. And if we begin to realize that, then we begin to realize why we're getting a little more tired, why we're getting a little more anxious, and why we feel so burned out, or may I say it, like just dead tired at the end of the day. 
if you even have an end of the day, because a lot of people are working manic because they're so worried about what's going to come next in terms of um, post-corona. Am I going to have a job? Do I need to look for a new job? How, if I've lost my business, how am I going to redo my business? And I've had some experience with this because I had to social isolate last fall. Um, as you, my girlfriend knew, um, I had sort of a bad health crisis and my doctors had determined that um, my organs were shutting down as a complication of my chronic cancer. But I said to them, I don't think so. I really, I don't think that's the case. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not dying. I think I'm just stressed. Um, and yeah, my body's reacting really badly. And so I thought about it for a while and I asked them if I could have a few months before they started the chemo. And they said, absolutely, a few months isn't going to make any, any difference. Because in my case, once you go on chemo, it's more of a regimen. It's like taking an aspirin a day, except you take a chemo pill once a week or you do chemo shots once a week. And um, I said, hey, like, is there any way we can stop that and, and look at other causes of this? Because at the exact same time in my practice, what I was seeing was um, clients saying to me, why am I so tired? Why am I so frustrated? Why am I so angry? Why am I just yelling at people for no reason at all? I know I'm being a bitch, like in my case, but I don't know why. Hey, can I say bitch? Is that okay? <laughs> Sorry. Ooh, so professional. But I mean, those are the questions I'm actually getting. And so one of the things that I began to look at is why is this happening? And it goes back to Mr. Jobs and introducing the smartphone. He really changed how we communicated. Prior to that, we still used face-to-face. -face. We still used, um, when we were in a meeting together, we could see each other, we could see each other's body language. We knew each other's social cues. Uh, and our brain could process that pretty well, even though we'd all been on email and had Blackberry since, I don't know, 2000. But it wasn't the same. We didn't have apps. We didn't have group chats. We didn't have a lot of these different kind of things. It is so interesting to me because what I began to look at, what I began to feel, began to reflect what others were saying to me in the research. And the research is actually based on 27,000 people. Um, we did quantitative and qualitative, and we also did focus groups. And what we began to look at with these 27,000 people is the same question I asked my physicians, which is, you know, does unclear communication cause stress? And does clear communication reduce stress? And what happened is my physicians actually said, you know, we don't know, but we suspect that's true because in May 2019, the WHO had said uh, workplace burnout is now a syndrome. It's a classified medical syndrome. It's not just something we think of in our heads anymore. And equally, males and females were reporting this low productivity, a negative attitude towards work. And um, a sense of disengagement from their job and from their team. Those are all actually, just so you know, sim symptoms of burnout. And I was suffering from all of those, but I was also working 24 seven. I was like on my phone all the time, but I wasn't understanding people clearly. So I did some research and I did, as you said, I found that we only understand out of every 10 emails, we only understand two of them, Andrea. And then if we don't understand, then we have to go back and we have to ask for clarification. And then we get clarification and maybe that person sent it to us super quickly. And then, you know, we have to get to that email. Well, on average, you receive 115 emails a day. And if you receive 115 emails a day and only 20% of those make sense, then you're going back and you're trying to figure out, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? And so then we start looking at the math and the math is insane. So I'm just going to read it right from my book because it's really easy. So if this is happening to you 80% of the time, so if you're working 80% of the time and you know, you're not working seven days a week, let's just say you're working five days a week. So you're working 253 days a year. So now you're working 253 days a year and now you're tired about 202 of them. 
you're exhausted, 202 of them. But if you can learn to clarify your communication by understanding classification, which is how your brain works and identifying patterns, then you can predict what people are looking for and respond. That allows you to take your 202 days and lower it to 177 days, and then you have 76 more better days. So how do you do this, which is what I get all the time. First of all, you understand how your brain works. Your brain, so this is your instinctive brain, which is just over your forehead, like this part of your brain, your frontal brain. Brain for now, we refer to that in um, many, many different literature, many different articles. Your middle brain is your mammalian brain. It's where patterns are housed. The smartphone I was talking about earlier has caused your instinctive brain, where all your quick and witty responses are, and I know you have those quick and witty responses, um, to, to come forward. So for example, when I was in my office, when I first started working, and my boss stormed across the floor and slammed his door, I knew it probably wasn't a good time to ask Bob for Friday off. Now, when I send Bob an email, I have no idea. And how do I even get someone on the phone? Like, even if I get someone on the phone, you have to schedule a meeting, you have to do, so you're missing that social cue. So you could ask Bob for Friday off and he could blow up at you. You have no idea why he's blowing up at you. So you have to ask for clarification. You have to go back and forth, back and forth, and you don't understand the patterns you're seeing in the email to him. So I began um, a couple of years ago on this research and my uh, diagnosis last year caused me to definitely speed it up and, and get all this working. I found that we can classify people by age. So if we classify people by age, that allows us to classify them by how they were educated and how they were introduced to technology and which technology they were introduced to first because that's how your mammalian brain creates patterns. For example, if we look at people that are over 60, most likely they're familiar with typing. Typing has a sound. Productivity, people were typing on computers at that time when they went into the workforce. They still talk about secretaries. They still talk about hearing the electric typewriter or a real typewriter. Some of my older professors always talk about having to uh, type out their dissertation, which I can only imagine would be it actually a living hell in my case but the sound of productivity then we look at education and how they were educated and they were educated very formally they had latin they had philosophy they had debate it was all based on language so now you have two patterns your brain is familiar with auditory language and formal um, which is how they were educated. Now let's go to Gen Xers. And don't forget, there's always cuspers, which are born plus or minus five. So in terms of technology, I say that boomers were born 1945 to 1960. And um, I refer to Gen X as 1960 to 1980, millennials 1980 to 2000, and Gen Z 2000 um, to 220, and then the alpha generation, generation is next. So a boomer Gen X would be somebody born in 1965. They'd have a bit of both patterns. And so you just become which one's stronger. Their Gen X is their dominant or their boomers are dominant. So then we look at Gen X and they had a little bit more introduction to computers, much quicker, but also television was much more part of our life. They were the CNN generation. And so when we think about the CNN generation, we know they were visual. We know in schools, they didn't have truant officers. They didn't have, you know, the same formality. We also know that education was like money was being pulled from education. So we got rid of philosophy. We got rid of Latin. We got rid of debate. So we know they're a little bit more casual, but what we didn't get rid of was you're personally responsible to do this, 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 and this. These are the tasks you have to do. This is when you have to get it done. And by the way, Gen X was born into all the recessions. So they're the first generation to ever graduate from high school and face layoffs. They, no one else had ever experienced that before, except for the great, great generation, which was during the first and second war. Then we look at millennials and poor millennials, by the time they got into school, education was decimated based on Reaganomics. Everybody was like, oh, education's a business and we're gonna pull money out of education so that we can lower taxes. 
But we also know this generation, the oldest of this generation was online by the fifth grade. They were already doing SMS. And they became very aware of Facebook and sharing and they were educated in groups. So now we have two more patterns. We have kinesthetic because the internet is all based on action and we have group learning. And then we go to Gen Z who were born into technology, were educated in groups, and we know that they're um, the YouTube generation, for lack of a better word. They learn everything from YouTube. They just go to YouTube. YouTube is now the largest search engine. Uh, and so now that we have those patterns, we're able to classify them, and we classify them by how they learned and the technology they used. And once you remember that, if I may, I can share my screen and show you then immediately you begin to understand a couple things about people, how they like emails and how you can write an email that actually captures their attention. So I'm going to send this to everybody afterwards, but let's just look at it in relation to what I just said. If we look at a boomer from 1945 to 1960, they're much more formal. So you tend to write the word dear. Then your subject line is more detailed and you write it in well-written paragraph form. Indicate an action required, the due date, and always attach a document. Always attach documents for boomers and Gen X because they were taught with technology that if, in fact, you go to um, a, a, sorry, a link, you could get a virus. And so they never went to the links, they never used, they never got the virus. But now, what you've just done there for a boomer when you've sent a pattern in that way, and you've classified them as a boomer, and it's easy to classify anybody, just go to LinkedIn. And if they have boomer tendencies and they're not a boomer, still use this format. You want to give people information in the way in which their brain is perceiving it. Then we go to Gen X. They're, hey, first name, very casual. Short, concise overview, project due, Thursday, need this. Overview and bullet points. Remember I said that they looked at um, television. Well, television always has supers underneath that are bullet points of the most important concepts in the news story. When I was still in television, we used to develop them based on that. We would pull the supers out of the best information and post it on the screen. Now we look at Gen Y and Gen Z. And Gen Y is far more casual. They were the first generation to call their parents friends by their first name. Um, when we look at action required, it has to be very detailed. They're also the first group that lived by a chart on the fridge because, first of all, many of them came from families who had divorced. They had um, stepmom, stepdads, mom goes to mom's house, goes to dad's house. It was all negotiated very well, but it was also very organized. This generation had play time. They did not, or they had play dates. They weren't just kicked outside with play time. And always indicate an action that can be required. Because this generation um, was just um, so close with their parents, they were also very organized as families. They took family vacations. And what we begin to see there is um, very much in terms of a chart on the wall for all the information they need. Then we look at Gen Z, and another factor we build into this is economics and parenting, but we don't have time to talk about that now. But with Gen Z, we see a far more casual generation who doesn't use email. They still use Google Classroom. A lot of them are using Snap. What we're seeing now is they're texting or using Zoom with their professors in this in COVID. And they're very good with it because they can see their professors. They often want to see most of their classmates, but they're still struggling with that. Um, and so that's just the beginning. And what I thought I would do right now is just like open it up to some questions. But I want to show people how we can actually pattern, like categorize people in a positive way, identify the patterns, and then react to those patterns so that we can lower our stress. And quickly, what we found in the research is once we began to teach people these patterns, Andrea, we were able to lower their stress 10%, increase their productivity 10%, increase their happiness 10%. And again, all of that increases your feeling of well-being and decreases your um, burnout by 10%. So I'll leave that with you. Thank you. I talk too much. No, that was fantastic. I'll get you to stop sharing your screen so we can see all of us. That'd be great. That's great. There we go. 
Um, so we've got a few questions from the, the from the group. Um, the first question that just came up is, and and um, as I'm asking this question, I want to encourage everybody that's on with us today, drop your questions into the Q&A so that we can get these out to Dr. Mary. Um, so the first question was, is, is there any differences between men and women? And are there any differences between roles within an organization, as an example, sales or legal or IT or marketing? Any thoughts on either of those? I don't study the differences between men and women. I have a number of colleagues that do, <clears throat> excuse me, and I can get information on that. Um, in terms of what I've seen in the data, no, I haven't seen a difference between men and women. Um, what I have seen a difference in is definitely in how they use technology. Um, to answer the second question, is there a difference in jobs? Um, we do see a difference in sales. Salespeople tend to gravitate to this very quickly, as do HR, because their whole world is dependent on this. But interestingly enough, we're starting to see project management and people in the Department of Defense really want to understand this even more because their whole job is based on people. If you have a job, for example, when I um, worked with engineers and they weren't working with people, they were working with numbers, this was less effective for them. Mm. Thank you. Um, another question that's just come in is, is it reasonable to ask folks to deal with how they like to be communicated with? Like, should you ask, because do people know, um, you know, or is this something that perhaps is a little bit more um, subconscious? Um, I always ask people how they want to be communicated with, as you know, but also um, in my book, I also give tons of charts. And if you want me to share a screen, I can show you some charts. Um, what you can also see is what not to do with different people, which I think is super important. For example, when you, um, and we saw this a lot in the research, a millennial who's stressed and you know, you're going to over four hours of meetings a day. I completed that research with Microsoft. You're tired. So you're like trying to send out emails and you may send an email to someone who's much older than you that says, Hey mayor, like I need this, this, and this. Well, a boomer will read that and go, first of all, wait, what? And already you've, um, you've, just, you've just set them off on your message. So they're gonna think more about negative. It's interesting that your brain focuses on negative and doesn't let it go. You focus 90% of most of the feedback you get, you perceive as negative when in fact it's positive. Mm. So let me just share real quickly again um, this screen and this may help. Um, when you don't have an opportunity to ask people how they want to be communicated with. Um, I think we can send these out to folks too. Yeah. In my book, I actually created characters called Ben and Adam and Trish and Taylor, and they were based on a composite of people, but real people. And um, I asked them if I could share some of the data on them, and they said, absolutely, just don't, you know, use my name. So... Um, what we talk about a lot are generational anchoring benchmarks in, in the economy, in learning, in parenting, in technology. And so I list some of those here. What I want you to focus on here is phrases that inspire engagement, because that's really what you're trying to do right now during COVID, is you want to engage people. You want to capture their attention and you need to get answers. And you can't just walk into someone's office anymore. And lots of times people will send you a quick Zoom request and you will just, you know, I can just ignore that right now. And so here's another way to use email or to use text. Um, Snapchat, absolutely. I've used Snapchat once, or Instagram messaging. I've never used Snapchat. My daughter uses Snapchat, but um, when you need somebody to respond to you immediately, phrase it in a way with a boomer that is, what is your opinion based on your experience? With a Gen X, help me picture this. With a, with a millennial, what do you think? Again, it goes back to their parents were incredibly inclusive, included them into the family, which we now all do as a parenting trend, by the way. And then interesting with Gen Z, ask them what they believe. And here are words that really stop people from listening. So when I'm watching you and 
we're together and you're in a room, I know you're not listening because you're like, you could be moving your head, you could be twiddling your thumbs, you could be on your phone. I'm like, okay, great. I am really boring and I'm just going to shut up right now. You can't figure that out digitally. You and I were talking about this pre-meeting. You could in fact be paying attention, but your cat now is behind you jumping up and down and what are you going to do? I don't know that. So one of the things you have to understand is digital listening, listening triggers. For a boomer, because they're auditory, they like to have an opportunity to be included in the conversation. So I'm probably pissing every boomer in the world off right now with my answer because I'm being so long and detailed. But with the Gen X, it's saying, no, no, you won't, because they always have to find a way to succeed. With the millennials, no, you can't. That's like a trigger for them of, oh, yeah, yeah, I can. I'll definitely do it. And for a Gen Z, it's no internet because they've been on the internet their entire lives. So again, happy to send out these charts, but what they do is again, show you patterns to help you reduce this assumption. I think these come from chapter one. Um, the introduction gives you the background to the research and how to test yourself with and do fun things with tests. There's another test in here that you can use called the VAC test that helps you determine how people like to process information from you. Lynn is asking, and I think this is a really interesting question. She says, why am I so angry? Yeah. So Lynn, that's, how, that's what started me on this research. And it's because you're so exhausted from people not understanding you, from people assuming they know what you mean, not clarifying they know what you mean. You're probably, you're probably sending great emails, but people aren't responding to them. So they're causing you to send two or three or four or five emails. What that happens is you begin to fight or flight. You're just starting to get really frustrated with them. And I suspect you're suffering from what we call in the book chronic anxiousness, which means you're constantly going into flight or flight because people are pissing you off because they're not responding. And that's what we want you to start doing. If you begin to categorize people, just try this for five minutes every day for five days and see how it begins to reduce your stress. Um, I've got some other activities that you can actually use to clear your mind and lower your stress before you get in. And Andre, I'm happy to do another workshop with you on that. Great. I hope that helps, Lynn. Text me if you need me, 416-564-2944. <laughs> <laughs> we all got that. Um, I'm going to get you to stop sharing your screen so we can we can see you. Oh, right. Sorry, guys. Um, so, Mary, I you know I have some questions. You know, I look. We've been um, sequestered now for about six weeks. We're all busily on digital communications. And as I as I mentioned in my my setup, you know, my team and I are all trying to navigate this. And I know I'm not alone in terms of, uh, you know, me and my team are not alone in that. We're all trying to do that right now. And, you know, there's an exhaustion factor that comes in with learning a new communication style. The fact, you know, you've just talked about the, the groupings, like, you know, clearly I'm not a millennial. Um, so, you know, I've got a different need from my team who many of them are millennials and, and some who even sort of fall into that Gen Z category. So as we're looking at all of these differences and we're also learning how to live and communicate in this place of isolation, what are some um, tips? Because I know for me, I've kind of started to hit a wall with some of it where I'm like, I don't know if I can be on one more Zoom call or I don't know if I can answer one more email. Um, so what are some tips that you would give us to just be able to cope a little bit better? You need to start structuring your digital day. First of all, when your body's saying, I can't do this anymore, don't do it. Get up, go outside, take a breath of fresh air for you in particular. Um, but also look for the beauty in things. If you can't leave your desk, take a picture, take a book, open a chapter, and then look down and just read two or three words. For a millennial, it'll be totally different. If a millennial feels that way, they need to just get up and walk and move. And I would suggest the first thing you do is as a millennial, take your hand, move your fingers, put your hand behind your back, and then reach your other arm back and pull. Because what your body is saying, I need time. So start to restructure your digital day with breaks. 
think about how you're going to take a break between meeting one and meeting two. What is your three minute break? The next thing you need to start doing is planning your day. Stop working 24 seven on this machine. Go and look at silly YouTubes. Like, you know, for my daughter, it's Bear in the Big Blue House that she goes back and looks at. Like, I'm actually training her brain to take a break, but God forbid she give up her phone because, you know, she's under 20. So for a boomer, what I've said is listen to some cool music. Now, all Gen X is out there, listen to me if you're at home with your children. Here is the best way to reduce your stress. Take your Mariah Carey, your Whitney Houston, you know, The Clash, whatever you happen to be into, turn it up and dance in front of the largest window in your house, yelling, I'm my kid's parent, just so you can embarrass them a little bit and feel normal again. And I got to tell you, it's the best stress reliever. And by the way, dancing in front of your window is a fantastic stress reliever. If you're not a dancer, do something else, do a puzzle. Like there's so many different things that you can actually go and do. So now you're going to plan your digital day with breaks. You're going to plan what you want to get accomplished the night before. And last but not least, shut your computer down and turn your phone upside down. Actually physically do something to clear your headspace. Mm. Plan your digital day, such an important topic. I mean, that's almost a topic unto itself, <laughs> you know, because I mean, just in, in the saying of that, I mean, we plan our days, but how often do we plan our digital days? And I think that's what this new normal is now requiring of us in a way that we've never really thought about before, that our days are digital. Um, and we've got a plethora of screens that, that sort of invade our space, everything from the computer to the, you know, the phone to maybe another, you know, some sort of a tablet to our TVs. So as we're sort of, you know, navigating between all of these devices and now planning that digital day, um, is there a difference as we move from device to device in how we can work with each other and also help ourselves? Um by moving from device to device, I'm not 100% sure. Do you mean app to app? Or do you mean like your phone to your computer? To yeah, I was, I was, and, and I mean, app to app probably as well. But I'm thinking more of like phone to iPad or, or some sort of a tablet to a, a laptop to a desktop to even a TV. Are there different ways because we're, I mean, these screens are pervading our space right now. Again, you have to classify them. So for me, like my my tv is my chill time i put it on when i'm cooking dinner i put it on for a fun movie with popcorn and cuddling that's it don't that that screen is not for work with my phone and my laptop always work like those so again i'm getting back into classifications mm. and patterns teaching your brain patterns so when my brain turns sees a tv it doesn't not work um, it just kind of chills, it relaxes. When, my, when I see a phone, it's very, very different. Um, the other thing that you want to start to look at is when you are using these screens, what is the physicality of your body? Are you sitting up in a chair or are you lounging on a couch? For a lot of millennials, they're like totally cool just sitting on a couch and working and they can easily shift for their screens from one to the other to the other. But again, they need that physicality. When they have a break, they have to actually get up and walk and move. And if you still want to have your phone, just put it in your pods and go and like do some walking. Do some, you actually need movement. And if we're talking about um, another cool technology, believe it or not, is making a comeback is the radio. The actual old fashioned radio. People are listening to it because there's live voices talking to them from their city. So it's, it's just different technologies that we're starting to see have different effects on relaxing your brain and getting some of those chemicals out of your brain than letting your body just physically relax. Mm. So important, you know, the, uh, I mean, again, the screens, the, the chemicals that happen in our brains because of that, it's, you know, so important that we start to pay attention to these, these things we've never had to before. And, and yet, you know, in the last five years, we've seen that happen more and more. I mean, it's been happening for 20 years, but five years, I think more specifically, and of course, today with what's happened with all of us in these, um, in these self-isolation places, 
even more so. And so I think a lot of people are living with, you know, some form of anxiety or or fear. And so is there something that you can suggest? I mean, I know it's a little bit off topic, but you know, that you can suggest it helps people stay a bit more positive in these uncertain times. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think what you need to start looking at is word journaling. So word journaling is a little different than traditional journey journaling. Um, word journaling can be done with your whole family. It can be done as an individual. It can be done um, on your phone or your laptop or your pad, your iPad. Um, it's writing one thing down that you've seen that causes you to smile in that day. So what is the one thing that made you smile? So for me, it was like, I, I've taken up running during COVID. I mean, with that many people in a tiny house, of course, what else would I do? And I ended up taking my dogs and they were covered in sand and it just made me laugh. And I was grateful for the opportunity to be able to go out on the beach and run and just get rid of my feeling of anxiousness. So I wrote down run. And, you know, when I asked my daughter, like what she grateful for, or what was her day grateful for, it was a Snapchat from a friend of hers she hadn't heard about. So she wrote Snapchat. And my husband wrote beer. So, <laughs> but like once you put your head into that space that's simple and easy and it's instant gratification, because you're like, okay, wait, I am kind of grateful for that. Like I, I was grateful the other day for tulips. Tulips were on sale for $3 a bunch. I was like, oh my God, I want tulips. So tulips was my word of the day. These are things that, again, you've got to play your mind against your mind. Your mind right now is getting 90% negativity from your screen because you're perceiving any feedback that you're getting as negative because you're already in chronic anxiousness. And as Lynn said, you're already tired and you're angry. And that's how I felt. So pull back, retrain your brain. Thank you. Great, great uh, advice. Absolutely. Retrain your brain. You know, we've gone on a bit of a journey here today from talking about, you know, digital communications, looking at those, those generational cues and how we can all uh, learn to communicate better simply by understanding who we're communicating with and what their come from places based on their generation. We've looked at um, creating a digital schedule. What is the digital schedule of your day and how we compartmentalize our screens by how we want to feel when we use them to finally word journaling. Mary, you have taken us all through a lot of information and what an amazing amount of tips that you've provided for us today. Thank you so much for all of what you have shared. And I'm, I'm so excited to have you back next week, I think, on our Changemaker 20 to answer even more questions. Because I know that as people start to live with this, you've given us such great information. They're going to come up with a hundred more questions. I know I that's so. going to happen. So um, as we, um, as we uh, start to say, um, thank you and farewell to Dr. Mary. I just want to remind you that her new book is coming out. And, and Dr. Mary, um, is it a, when will it be available? Uh, it's available in September from McGraw-Hill on Amazon, amazon.ca and amazon.com. Great. So look for that new book. It's called Message Received. Um, and this is going to help you and your team collaborate at a much higher level, even though you may be working remotely and depending on digital communications. Um, it will help you to understand digital communication by how your brain processes language digitally. And we've heard a little bit of that today with Dr. Mary. She's starting to give us some of those brain cues. And you know, our brain is such an interesting place to, to learn, to, to spend some time to learn some new things. So I encourage you all to look for that book. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Mary is also available for virtual speaking engagements. Um, and it's something that we can absolutely help you out with. If you think your team could be um, helped with some of these tools, she absolutely can come and do a virtual lunch and learn with your team. 
We've got a great week next week lined up for you with our Changemaker 20s Tuesday to Thursday and our sense-making conversation on Friday. Tuesday, we have Cherry Rose Tan, who is an expert in how to communicate and bring up uncomfortable feelings. Cherry Rose um, is, works with founders and helping them to work through burnout so that they can show up for family and teams more fully. On Wednesday, we have Rachel Parent. Rachel is a young uh, a young person who is focused on climate change and sustainable foods. Rachel go, does a deep dive into many of the changes that we've seen through these last few weeks. Um, and she is absolutely amazing. She has been on, she's been a TEDx uh, speaker. She has uh, uh, been on TV and it gives us a whole new way to look at climate change and sustainable eating. And then on Thursday, we welcome Dr. Mary to come back and do her Changemaker 20 with us. So make sure you keep all of those questions ready. And then on Friday, we have uh, Melanie Parrish. Melanie is the author of The Experimental Leader, and she's going to share with us some strategies for how we can all be better leaders as we move into these changing times and we learn how to use experimentation as part of our leadership style. So thank you again. I am really looking forward to those 76 more really good days. <laughs> I'm going to say that right now. And I want to thank you all for being here with us today. As we say every time with all of our work, stay safe, stay healthy, stay connected. And we look forward to the next intelligent conversation with each of you. Take care. <laughs>